We are preaching the fullness of the Zoe life, which is immortality. And by the time you have obtained the fullness of the Zoe life in your soul, you can rest in glory, waiting for that day when the event of resurrection will occur, when you will pick up your glorified body and then walk again in this realm. So the level, the race is to embrace immortality while in this life. The immortality is not in the body, it's in the soul. That's why the race is to test the fullness of the world life. Because the soul of man was made in the realm of God in Eden. Corruptible, but not corrupted. But man chose to fall into corruptibility. And having been corrupted, God said, no problem. The only people that will be given an incorruptible body will be those who in their corruptible body had obtained an incorruptible soul. So rising and raising the soul to the level of incorruptibility is the ticket you have for an incorruptible body. So the race of our Christian faith is to make sure that our soul is raised to that height of purity where it will detest corruptibility. And even no matter the level of trial, it still stands without being defiled. That is the lot of the overcomers. And with that, they end for themselves the incorruptible body of the glorified body. So the glorified body is a reward for the saints who have endured all manner of challenges and maintained their testimony. That's why Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive the crown of life. When Paul finished, he didn't, what he finished was not evangelizing the whole world. In his labor, in his submission, he was very mindful, telling himself that he's not beaten about the bush as an endless man, that he has his eyes very well focused, so that he will not preach this gospel to others, and he himself will be a castaway. That he's focused on pummeling his body, bringing his body under subjection to make sure that his soul tests that fullness of the Zoe life. And by the time he tested it, he says it's finished. By the time they were, the prophecies from the Holy Ghost was even coming, about the threat to his life and what he did. He said, I'm not bothered about this. The one thing that is simple that I'm concerned about. He said, my life, my bias life is not my concern. My bias life is not my concern. My concern is my Zoe life. That I may finish the course. I may complete by my undertaking and risk and challenges before me that at the end, the heavens might record it for me that I completed the courses needed for my soul to test that, com that fullness of the Zoe life, which is my ticket for a glorified body. So when he finished, he says, I'm done. It's finished. What is waiting for me now is on that day when the glorified body will be shared, I will stand in my Lord to collect my own. Because while in my human body, my soul has been brought to that height of obtaining the Zoe life in its fullness. And the reality, brother, is that at any level that your soul measures up to regarding the worst life, that is the degree of your reward. That's why don't make, Christians will not be rewarded the same anyway. Of course, we all know that. That the degree of your reward is to the degree that your soul has progressed to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
The fullness of Christ is bringing down that the soul to be like Jesus Christ. That's why our focus is to be like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus got to a state of existence and earned for himself a glorified body. Paul did that. Stephen did that. The apostles did that. The standard will never be lowered for us. That's why do not allow anybody to deceive you. And if you choose to be deceived, progress with it. It's to the degree every man shall be rewarded according to what he had done in his body, period. Everyone will be rewarded according to what you have done. If you like, be playing game and be mischievous and be proving to others you are a Christian. There's nothing to prove. It's either you are godly or not. If your game is just to make others believe, you will receive exactly as you are. So at this level, you don't get distracted by anybody trying to Confuse you. Just focus and make progress with Christ. That's why as Christ is lifted behold before you and you behold him, as you behold him, the transformation in your soul is daily taking place. The inner man is renewed day by day. That is the process of resurrection and it takes a lifetime to achieve it. That's why we keep saying, brethren, do not relax. Do not relax. Because if you stop making progress, that is the level at which you will be rewarded. And what, if we go further, you see there's what is called first resurrection, there's what's called second resurrection, we'll come there. Depending on the degree you attend, those who completed their own work in their soul, they end for themselves the first resurrection. Those who are wishy-washy, of course, they will join the rest in the second resurrection, if ever they make it in the second resurrection. So, this is a picture that we wanted to clarify regarding the concept of resurrection. Summarizing, it is very clear what we are seeing that first, resurrection is a coming back from death to life. And from what we have seen, we can see clearly that it attends to our different paths. That Jesus, the resurrection is a man, the Christ. Resurrection is a process. And resurrection is an event in the last day. The man, the Christ, walks, has quickened our spirit, completed. Done. And we are presently in the process of daily rising and experiencing moral and spiritual resurrection going on in our soul every day. But finally, depending on how that process has been completed, we will experience the event of resurrection. Now let me bring this analogy to make it clearer. It's like gaining admission into the university. Your admission letter and matriculation is like the man resurrection bringing you up, quickening you and raising you up. That is your matriculation. You have obtained admission and you have done your matriculation. Then you now go into the school. That is the process of resurrection. And there you start doing your, attending your class, assignment, exam, tutoring, every day, and it takes a whole lifetime of your existence on the campus. How faithful you complete that will guarantee whether you participate in the convocation, which is the event of resurrection that has to do with the body. So your matriculation is the beginning, a quickening, a start, an introductory, an entrance into the kingdom of God. For except a man be born again, he cannot see. And the same man be born of the water, he cannot enter. 
Now that you have entered the school, the study, the whole activity, which is more tedious, the practical, the assignment, the projects, the school, the all the exams, all but now across the years. Remember, matriculation is one day, convocation is one day. But the process of resurrection, which is the school, is all the years appointed for you in that school. So it's important to use this analogy to compare what we're trying to talk about. And it makes sense. And there's so much to do in our soul, transforming us until we become partakers of the divine nature. And therefore, qualify and be entitled to obtain a divine body. So I just want to, want to round it up here for us to see what God has in store for us as a people so that we wouldn't just get this thing haphazard. I have realized that many of us, even Christians who are within the kingdom of God pursuing this, don't have clarity about some of these things. And I trust the Lord as he has begun, he will help us to flow with it until we come to that level of clarity so that we will now know where to position ourselves regarding the race and run to obtain. Paul said that run to obtain because not all that are running obtain the, 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 the crown. But you, you should run to obtain. When I realize what is at stake by the Lord guiding me, I had made up my mind to obtain this resurrection body. I'm now self-driven from within. Because I don't, I don't care about who is talking what outside. God will grant me grace that I will labor to obtain. Because it is clear to me that if I don't walk up myself to that point of purity and perfection, I run a risk of meeting, missing this glorified body what resurrection means in this concept. That it is the antidote of death. There will be no resurrection if death never occurred. The occurrence of death is what necessitates resurrection. So resurrection implies that there had been life, then death occurred. And after death, then resurrection is bringing back from dead to life again. In other words, in the process of our existence, death does not have the last say. Resurrection does. But resurrection is the final thing, not death. To the world, death is the end. As far as they are concerned, a necessary end. To us, resurrection beyond death is the end. Not until we are resurrected back from the dead to live. Just as Jesus Christ was resurrected back from the dead. No, that is our aim. That's why the scripture was so plain that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is just foolish and futile. The blessed be God, he rose. And that he rose offers us hope that we will rise. That if only in this life we have hope, then amongst all men we will be most miserable. Thank God that it's not about this bias life. The Zoe life, which is eternal life, an endless life, offers us the hope that if we have once lived on earth, that we shall live again. And this is the business of the kingdom of God to all who believe. That if they have once lived on earth, that they have the opportunity of sowing in obedience to God now, as to reap the odd, another opportunity of living on earth. Another opportunity of living. Uh, Jesus, in his obedience, he earned the opportunity of rising from the dead and living in this atmosphere with his disciples for 40 days. But because the time appointed is yet to come, when we and all the house of God and all the people of God will be resurrected with Christ in that same fashion has now come 
all of us who go to rest at this time wait for that time. When it comes, we will all be resurrected to express ourselves again on this realm. This is the hope that the business of God offers us. Now, most Christians believe, of course, that it's all about once we live here, once we die, we go to heaven and stay there forever. No, that is not what the Bible teaches. My mother, who is no longer in her body, who lived a godly Christian life, is no longer here. She rests with God in glory. But the word of God said that they shall Jesus bring with him when he is coming. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And the Bible says when Jesus is coming, he will bring with him. So if heaven is the last destination for them, why would Jesus bring with them when he's coming this way? That's why Jesus said, as we pray, we ask God, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as already done in the heaven. Because God has plans of bringing heaven to the earth. And Satan has plans of bringing hell to the earth. It is the resurrection that will stand to the controversy. And when God and all his saints have taken their firm grip in this realm, we will see a glorious new day. The Bible says the new heaven and the new earth we are enjoying righteousness. So we have a promise of God of living again on this realm. As Jesus died and rose back and was seen of many people who bore witness that they saw him alive even after he had died and buried. That he rose. So shall we be also. Now, having said all that in our last episode, this, now we want to look at, examine the various words, how resurrection as a word was used in the scripture and the various meanings. It's important that we look at that. It's in a brief session. Look at that. The first word resurrection, the meaning of the word resurrection, brings us to an understanding. First, Jesus told Martha in John 11, 25, 23. He says unto her, thy brother shall live again. If Lazarus is dead and brought back to life, that is resurrection. If a brother, a sister, or anybody who is living this life dies and has gone to be with the Lord and the church stands to pray that that person be recovered, it is raising the dead. Jesus gave the church the authority to raise the dead and we are very well acquainted with that. That resurrection is different from the resurrection that Jesus experienced. But if you look at the Bible, it's all raising from the dead, raising from the dead. The resurrection, the resurrection that Jesus demonstrated by raising people to death. Remember, man found it difficult to believe that God is able to raise the dead. Man found it very difficult. And that was why Paul was asking Agrippa. He said, why do you consider it is incredible that God is able to raise the dead? That's the argument to Agrippa. Because he was talking about the resurrection of the dead. And Agrippa was saying, oh, I mean, your too much learning has made you mad, Paul. He said, no, no, why do you consider it incredible that God should raise the dead? So it's difficult for people to believe that God can raise the dead. But the challenge here is simple. Paul argued that God is able to raise the dead. Why? Because he met Jesus Christ, whom apparently had died, and he met him right away. So we see here that Jesus, when he came on board in ministry, raising the dead was something else. So 
The first thing he did was to meet the daughter of a rich man. I'm sure we're well acquainted. The girl died. And as he died, the rich man has appealed for him to come. Before he arrived, the girl had died. The man was confused. So Jesus got there. The monarchs were all over the place. I'm very sure that we are acquainted with that story. What happened was that he went in and raised the girl and gave back to the parents. And those who were mourning started laughing and said, ah, oh, the girl did not die. That shows the degree of unbelief and contempt to supernatural realities. They never believed. These are people who are crying that the girl had died. Now, the girl has been raised to bad because he went and said, Talita Kume, and raised the girl back. Suddenly, they started laughing. Why are they laughing? Because they, is, they, 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 dis, they disdain the fact that they could believe that the girl came back from the dead. Nonetheless, Jesus ignored them and proceeded. The next episode, because they felt, ah, the girl is just sick and we assume that she, she's dead. Why should we even believe it? No problem. The next one is no longer the daughter of a rich man, but the son of a poor widow. The son of a poor widow, the son of the widow of Nair. As they, this young man has died, this time not on the bed or in the room, they have put the boy in a coffin, going to bury the boy. So that that's, settles the case. They're going to bury the boy, Right on the way, Jesus intercepted and raised the boy. Again, unbelief. It was met with unbelief. And the people were saying, uh -uh, why could it be that stupid, thinking that the boy is dead? But you are the ones that have put the boy in the coffin and are going to bury the boy. And you challenge, you do not believe that Jesus is able to raise the dead. The next one is now Lazarus, a full-grown man. This time when he heard that Lazarus was sick unto death, he didn't want to hasten uh, it. So let him die, let him be buried, so that there will be no argument. The first girl, there was an argument because she was in the room. The second boy, argument because on the way to be buried. This time, Lazarus died well. Settled, died very, very well. So Lazarus died and was buried. And after three days, on the fourth day, he went and raised him up. Bible said that Jesus was aware that Lazarus was sick unto death. Then he told his disciples that this sickness is that God might be glorified. So after Lazarus is now dead, he went. And the, for his thinking, yes, at least, the authenticity of the fact that he is thinking closes the argument whether he's dead or not. He now went and raised him. By the time he raised him, if you look at that passage, the Bible stated that the Jews were Plotting to kill Lazarus again. To nullify the fact that Jesus raised him from death. And somebody is saying, if they kill this man, this man that raised him, would he be able to raise him back again? This tells you what Satan has done in humanity. The total obliteration of the consciousness of God within man is the achievement of Satan. But blessed be the name of the Lord. There is resurrection. Now, all this we have said, the rich man's daughter, the poor widow's son, and the full-grown man Lazarus. The type of resurrection they had is that they were raised from death back to bios life. I want us to get that. Because it's important that we get the concepts. They were raised back to the realm of bios life. 
the biological life. Because, how do I know? They are all dead again. Even though they have been raised, they are all dead again. But Jesus was not raised, the type of resurrection that Jesus experienced was not to the realm of the bias life. Jesus was raised to the realm of the Zoe life. A life that cannot die again and does not, cannot experience corruption. Jesus was raised back to an incorruptible realm. Lazarus and the rest, Dorcas and all of them that we saw in the scripture who died and were prayed back and raised back to life, experienced this all in the realm of the Bible. They were returned to this realm of bios life where they can die again biologically. The Greek calls the return to the realm of the bios life Anistemi. Anistemi. Which is important. Anistemi. But the return to the realm of the way life, Anastasis. So there are two different resurrections there we can see. One is bringing back people to the realm of the bios life. The other is bringing them back to the realm of the zoe life. To the bios life is an istemis. To the zoe life is anastasis. They all convey different concepts of resurrection. So basically, it's important we note that. So when we talk about resurrection, we wouldn't be confused. The other aspects of resurrection also, which we will talk, but it's important to stress this concept. As we go into the study, when we meet each one, it's for you to know what we are referring to. There are two other concepts which we will not handle immediately, but as we progress, we meet it and explain what it means. Because there is also the aspect of resurrection that was experienced by the holy men who were buried in the holy city of Jerusalem when Jesus gave up the ghost. Remember the Bible in Matthew? was very clear that when he gave up the ghost, there was earthquake, there was thundering, and there was darkness, and the veil in the temple tore into two, and the earthquake shook the ground that the graves of holy men opened up, and the people came out of their graves, walked through the streets of Jerusalem, and showing themselves to many. Now, that type of resurrection is called agesis. We will look at it. We will look at it at the right time and know where it belongs. Agesis. Now, there is another concept of resurrection, which is the fourth one I'll end here. When Jesus was at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible said his physical form was Metamorph food changed, transfigured. Here comes Moses and Elijah, made themselves visible to Peter, James, and John, who never met them in life. When they saw them, they recognized them and they called them by name. Jesus was there, and before them in the Holy Mount had a change. Of his frame, his being was transfigured by an overwhelming power and glory of God that his remnant started glowing, radiating the radiation from God. That kind of transfiguration change is called ek anastasis. So you have anastasis, anistemis, 
ekanastasis and egasis. We will pause here today and continue from here in our next episode. Thank you very much.